Hello and welcome to Classic 15. I'm Michael Beek. My guest this week is Myrid Bowen, Chief Executive and Artistic Director of the Britain Sinfonia. His current role is the continuation of a life steeped in music. Once a choral scholar at King's College, Cambridge, Myrid managed the Hilliard Ensemble, served as the director of both the Litchfield and Cheltenham Music Festivals, and was recently head of artistic planning with the BBC National Orchestra and Chorus of Wales. Myrid, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be asked. Now, I've worked uh, at a classical music venue and I'm now with a classical music magazine and we always talk about this idea of the core audience. I wonder, do you think the core audience is a misunderstood bunch? Do they get a bad rep? I suppose it depends who you ask. Generally speaking, we in the uh, the promoter end of things have a fairly clear idea of what that core audience is and what they look like and what age group they are. And they won't surprise you to learn that they generally speaking they're they're on the older side Mm. and whether we like it or not they tend to be um middle class and upper middle class and reasonably well cashed up i suppose that's a a terrible stereotype of that core audience but i i think that's probably what it is um in uh sort of cultural terms they're they're they tend to be well educated and professional class as it were Mm. And they are interested in theatre and film and literature and what used to be called high art, I suppose. Yes. Uh, it, it's a very unsatisfactory way of describing them. And it, and it's a very sort of reductive way of describing them. But you asked me the question and you, <laughs> you got some kind of answer. Having said that, I, I'm acutely aware and I think all of us are and, and my colleagues in uh, where I work now and in previous jobs and all sorts of colleagues in, in the business uh, we're very aware that there are lots of micro audiences out there and yeah. you know there, there are various marketing companies that have drilled down into those micro audiences and give, given them names uh, metropolitan culture buffs or thrill seekers <laughs> yes, or I whatever whatever, yeah. whatever they they might have come up with and uh-huh. Some of those names were possibly a bit cringy along the way, but actually I think they are quite useful for us to to think in terms of of breaking down that that rather un, unhelpful stereotypical view that I just gave you of the so-called core audience, because it's it is ultimately much more subtle and nuanced than that. And mm-hmm. depending on the kind of repertoire that you've programmed or the kind of artists that are, are being being promoted. Um, there are obviously opportunities to reach a, a wider range of different people um, mm. with different tastes and different needs, different abilities to attend cultural events. So in, in my, my last big previous job, when I was director of the Cheltenham Music Festival, uh, the great ability that I had there was, was to program things across 10 or 12 days that, that took place at all different times of day in all s- different sizes of venues yeah. uh, with different durations as well. And I think... Mm. That made me very aware, or I, I was always very aware when programming that that ten years worth of festivals in Cheltenham. That in in doing that with those different venues and durations and times of day and night, that you were able to attract different kinds of audiences as a result, and therefore I probably didn't make myself very popular with my marketing colleagues because I I was, <laughs> or or maybe maybe not maybe they. Maybe they were appreciative of the opportunity to to market to different kinds of people as a result, people who might want just an hour of something quite relaxed or cool or whatever at 10 o'clock on night or 10 o'clock at night or a completely different kind of person who doesn't want to go out in the evening, uh, not confident driving in the dark or whatever, all those kind of reasons, but is very happy to go to a very mainstream and sedate chamber music concert in a lovely um heritage kind of venue in the morning yeah. so you know you, you that way you design a program which can potentially appeal to all sorts of different kinds of audiences br- broken down from a so-called core audience and like you say there's there's great nuance in, in across audiences and how how do you whether it's as a festival or as a venue or an ensemble how do you get to know the audience and how do you sort of get to understand what it is they require of you i suppose that's a very interesting one i mean we we all do audience surveys and you can do lots of anecdotal market research and in intervals and after concerts and yeah. you can look at social media at the reaction of certain things and 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 learn from that maybe but of course social media is very self-selecting anyway mm. um and is perhaps 
generationally a bit divided. I mean, I've noticed for many years now that certain kinds of concerts where it is a little bit more mainstream, classical and core, and perhaps, generally speaking, more attractive to older people, uh, those concerts, however wonderful they are and well attended they might be, they have very low traction. They tend to have very low traction on mm. on Twitter or Facebook, maybe because just just because of the the demographic that that that's the core of that audience. Whereas something, I mean, Britain Symphonia did something in the Barbican last April with a, a cultish sort of folky indie singer songwriter called Father John Misty, who I have mm. to say I had not even heard of before we were booked for the concert. Yeah. Uh, but it's apparently sold out within about eight minutes of going on on sale on the Barbican wow. website. Uh, so we were very clear at that point that he had massive pulling power amongst a completely different audience to my my own sphere of, of knowledge or experience. And, uh, you know, social media went absolutely crazy for that concert because the average age of that concert was somebody, something in their 20s, 30s, 40s maybe, and clearly much more engaged with, with social media. So you 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 learn different things from, from that kind of thing. But going, going back to your question, some of it's very educated guesswork and you just sort of surmise what might work with mm. a certain kind of person or certain kind of type of person. And sometimes you get it right. And and the people who turn up in the numbers that you think might turn up is absolutely spot on. And in other cases, you you get it horribly wrong and um, your audience projections, your, your box office predictions are a way out either way, positively yeah. or negatively. So it, it, it's there, there are there are marketing people out there who treat it as scientifically as they possibly can and they've got phds in it and they they're very data driven um i'm not like that at all i'm i'm interested in hearing from marketing colleagues who who have that kind of much more sort of scientific and rigorous expertise but i'm yeah. i i try to glean from that as much as i can but also from my perspective as a as a program planner a sort of artistic person as a sort of curatorial gatekeeper i i have to do it a lot more intuitively i suppose mm, sure and is it is it different for you doing that for a festival as, as compared to doing it for, let's say for a music venue or for the ensemble is, is there are different approaches um, is it easier for a festival in many respects as it's for a shorter spell of time or is it actually slightly more pressured because you have to make that that individual festival a success i think it possible well yeah there, there are there are pros and cons for for both with the mm. festival the advantage is that that you you can program morning afternoon evening and late night and like i was saying earlier catch or potentially attract different kinds of audiences that way people are attracted to different genres of music and other cultural events that you're able to offer up in mm. a perhaps more widely spanning festival the challenge with a festival which you try to turn to your advantage, as you, as you say, it's 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 only in a week or over a weekend or a couple of weeks, and so you're putting all your eggs in in that basket. And there's no other if it if it's a two week festival, the other fifty two weeks of the year you've got no other options. So you've got to get it right as much as possible within that short period. Whereas, of course, with a with a venue or a, a year long season for an orchestra, say, or an opera company. You've got many more opportunities to get it right and wrong throughout the season. I'd say that with the festival, and this this is all about location. The best festivals happen in 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 places that people want to come to, and as a as a kind of destination, cultural tourism kind of place. And of course, the best examples in this country are Edinburgh and Aldborough. But where I was for, for a decade in Cheltenham, it's a pretty desirable place in the Cotswolds, um, lots of lovely buildings, lots of lots of good hotel and restaurant options and good walking in the Cotswolds um, in between performances. So as a, as a kind of cultural holiday, you, your offer to people coming to Cheltenham or nearby to the Three Choirs Festival, for example, is a very strong one. So the challenge, therefore, is not to rely just on your own population 
Cheltenham, 100,000 people, you might reckon on 5,000 of those 100,000 people being the kind of cultural target for what your offer is. Um, but you need to sell a hell of a lot more tickets across that two week period than just those 5,000 people might be buying into or pos- quite possibly even fewer than that 5,000. So you need to attract people from further afield and to, to come and stay for a few days. And And certainly my experience was People came from far and wide, right around the UK, but also from, you know, there were regulars coming from Holland or America or New Zealand or whatever. And that's very much the case with with successful festivals. Um, and and that that is what a festival can can offer. And of course, again, Edinburgh is is the international worldwide leader in 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 that kind of a, a, a attracting people to to a place um, and spending a lot of cultural pounds in the process as as far as planning for a concert season with an orchestra like i am now at britain symphonia we have three residencies in 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 london at the barbican and at saffron hall near cambridge in north essex and then in norwich and we do yeah. six or seven own promotions and presentations in each of those places throughout the season from roughly speaking october to june and you have to get the balance right and it's it's actually much harder throughout a season like that with only fairly infrequent visits say you're you're in Norwich in early October and then the, the next time you're there might be the end of November and then the next time early February or something so it's very hard to to plan thematically mm. in that sense whereas I always enjoyed in Cheltenham with a 10 12 day festival to to try and tease out lots of interconnected strands thematically and with not just musically but through spoken word and film screenings and things it was it was always a really enjoyable challenge to hit the sweet spot thematically Mm -hmm. with with a particular festival with the help of some composer anniversaries or other other things yeah it's much harder to do that with i'm finding now with with a a drawn out spread out concert season i think the symphony orchestras it's easier because they in their london or birmingham or manchester homes they're performing much more frequently to a core audience that they can rely on and, and take people on a sort of more joined up journey, I suppose. Um, and, you know, there have been examples, fantastic examples of that over the years with 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 the symphony orchestras pulling together some fantastic themed series across their seasons. And is the onus only on you guys and, and, and doing this promoting and, and working with these these ensembles? Or, is, or are there anything, is there anything that artists should be doing? I think a lot of them are. I think um, you'd, you'd have to have serious blinkers on if you weren't a a, a student or a recent um, graduate from one of the conservatoires or a performer in their 30s or 40s, if you if you were under the impression that af- everything was completely straightforward in, in this country and, and that um, there were there were just ready made audiences for pretty straight down the line, obvious kind of programming that, that you'd, you'd, you'd have to be blind. <laughs> You'd, 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 you'd have to be on another planet to think that at this stage. So I think a lot of creative artists are very responsive and thoughtful about that and are hopefully are being um, encouraged to think like think in different ways from the from the word go, um, even before they get to music college. And mm-hmm. um, certainly I, I yeah, I'm very aware of, of younger performers and composers who uh, and people with with their own groups and and they're approaching us all with, with with their own fresh ideas and ways of new ways of presenting things new ways of funding things which is always very attractive if if you if people approach you with with partially or wholly funded projects already that's yeah. that's always a good way to get us to carry on reading the emails um so no i i i, I don't think the onus is just on us but um we we have to be really open to to all the ideas and we have to be able to listen um all of us on on both sides of the fence the performing side and the planning side we we should have our ant- antenna out all the time and um picking up on the signals and and um sniffing out the next opportunity well Marik, thank you so much for your time today it's been a pleasure chatting about this with you thank you very indeed. Much indeed well thank you thank you for having me That's all from this edition of Classic 15. Our podcasts are available on all platforms. 
and on our website www.classic.com where you can also find Classic's online concert series and other media on demand. And don't forget to check us out on social media too, at Classic Music. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.